The Working Preacher team holds you in prayer during this difficult time. God bless you for all the ways you proclaim the gospel, and may God be with you as you navigate this new way of doing your ministry. We believe that biblical preaching changes lives, and Working Preacher is the most direct way to provide support, encouragement, and assistance to biblical preachers. In this ongoing pandemic, many preachers feel isolated, but Working Preacher is still there with preachers every week through the podcasts and our website to provide support during this time. If you or a preacher you know depends on Working Preacher, both for sermon writing and spiritual strength, now is the time to support it financially. If you are already a sustainer, your increased participation at any level enables us to continue updating this resource to support preachers and lay leaders during this time when they need it most. We cannot keep Working Preacher up to date or even open without the generous support of donors. I'm so grateful for your help. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the fourth Sunday of Easter, which falls on May 3rd, 2020, are from Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47, Psalm 23, 1 Peter 2, 19 through 25, and the gospel reading is John 10, 1 to 10. Because uh, the fourth Sunday of Easter is always Good Shepherd Sunday. So here we are on Good Shepherd Sunday and year A, it's John 10, 1 to 10. Year B, John 10, 11 to 18. And year C, John 10, 22 to 30, which has nothing to do with John 10, 1 to 18, but it has sheep and so Therefore, it is on the fourth Sunday of Easter. However, what uh, is uh, interesting about this year A lection is not so much the focus, of course, on the Good Shepherd, because that's, uh, that's the I am statement in, chap in verse 11, but on the gate or the door uh, as a life-giving image. And uh, but we didn't have enough hymns uh, to call it Door Sunday or Gate Sunday, so we went with Good Shepherd Sunday. Hey, but, Carolyn, did you know that uh, John 10, 1 actually just continues the discourse? It's really the discourse on the healing in John 9. No way. Yeah, it's true. There's actually no, there's no actually like distance between John 9 and 10. No, Jesus does not stop talking. So um, I say this every time this comes around, but and that's uh, a summary of John's gospel right there. Jesus doesn't stop talking <laughs> about himself, Matt. <laughs> yes, let's make that very clear. Uh, yeah, you know, it. I know I say this every year, but uh, but it is an important reminder that this is the discourse to the healing of the man born blind. And so, in other words, what Jesus uh, what Jesus talks about here, uh, in particular. Is, uh, is making a connection back to the blind man who is now not just the man who was blind and now sees, but really now one of Jesus' own sheep, uh, one, of, uh, one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, fast forwarding to John 10, 16, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And so it's, uh, it's, I think it's important to read these verses as the promise to the blind man. Uh, this, these, these don't come out of nowhere. Essentially, the blind man and Jesus have acted out. They have embodied these, these very promises that we see in John 10, 1 to 10. And so it, I, because it's so easy, so easy to allow these verses to kind of get disembodied and disengaged from uh, the promises to the blind man. And the man born blind, again, is not, is not just able to see again, but is brought into Jesus' fold, particularly when he was thrown out of that fold in 934. And so Jesus finds him uh, and, 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 and brings him back into the fold. Uh, and I think another, uh, another thing, just by way of introduction, and um, then I, I'm sure you all want to jump in, uh, is that 
uh, it, I, it's an important, it, oftentimes this, these verses in particular get uh, read in a kind of exclusivity, uh, exclusive kinds of claim, like Jesus, Jesus is the gate, Jesus is the door, particularly uh, uh, foreshadowing John 14, 6. But the way in which that the gate or the door, it's really door, but it's, it's translated gate because sheep and, you know, but is, is this life-giving image of abundant life, of pasture, of, of provision. Uh, and, uh, and so it's, and it's also a, uh, an image of protection. And, and, and that, that's this whole, this whole section here is really get, is what gets, uh, get gets re-embodied in the rest of Jesus, which perhaps we have kind of remember from Good Friday, but uh, where Jesus is once again the door or the gate who stands between uh, his disciples who are safely in the garden and those outside of the garden, the thieves and the bandits and the soldiers who are trying to uh, infiltrate the garden and um, and Jesus Jesus stands in the way and says, uh, if you're looking for me, let these um, let these let these men go. So uh, the door is uh, is this uh, the way in which you uh, can take this opportunity to expand on this life giving giving image of the door or the gate. I think would be um, that's one direction I would go. I wanted to ask you about the whole door thing, and in some ways, the last couple of minutes you answered the question talking about security and emphasizing the importance of this is an, an image of safety or of safekeeping. And you have to help people imagine that what's outside the door is dangerous for the metaphor to work. And especially, you know, maybe Americans in general don't like the image of doors or gatekeepers. And in the church, we sometimes worry about gatekeepers, but to talk about real threat out there is I think really essential. Am I hearing you right on that? Yeah, I, yeah, it is. I mean, it, it, uh, it you know what are those what are those forces that uh, would cause uh, would cause harm or even death to uh, Jesus followers, Jesus disciples, Jesus sheep? How so, do we? Oh, mm -hmm. go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that yeah. So that that's uh, that is that's one of the you know that's one of the roles of the gate, right? Or one of the roles of the door is that is that uh, act of protection. But I think you know the. But that's not the only, right? The, the gate is also the, the passageway of going in and out and finding pasture. And so it's also, to, you have to go out to find pasture also for provision uh, so that the sheep are fed. So it's, um, I think it, it, you, you kind of have, you really have to hold both of those together. Is it yeah, a I want to avoid the insularity, you know, the, the kind of sectarian view of, we need Jesus to watch the thresholds for us because everything outside is dangerous and everybody outside is dangerous is what I worry about. But go ahead, Joy. Well, in reading this, uh, because of what you were saying back when, when you um, kind of uh, foreshadowed this as we were talking about John 9, when I was reading this, I read it differently uh, that I think might address what you're talking about, Matt, and that is... Um, the, the response of the disciples, uh, we're told, is they don't get it. And uh, I asked myself, so what, what are we missing here? The disciples didn't get it. The disciples are fishermen. And Jesus is using uh, a shepherd imagery. And that becomes just a wonderful uh, demonstration of the fact that Jesus is talking about having others than just this small group that are a part of his disciples. It's, it's right there in the conversation that he's having with fishermen using familiar metaphors of shepherds and, and sheep. Uh, and I don't think I would have seen that, uh, Caroline, if you had not um, kind of drawn that out in chapter nine. And I think, Matt, that that invites us us not to read this as a um, sectarian view, but clearly as an invitational uh, uh, opportunity. 
Well, it also needs to be, you know, in the wider context of John uh, that, you know, there is a tendency to locate John as, uh, as you know, kind of a sectarian missile. <laughs> um, and there's some truth to that. But, uh, but it has an extraordinarily apostolic uh, sense to it. I mean, it's, um, you know, for God so loved the world. And then John 10, 16, uh, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. And, you, and then you look forward to John 20. Uh, I, as the Father has sent me, so also I send you. And so, and in fact, uh, going another, another, I think, homiletical promise in this uh, too, is to also go and look at John 21, where Jesus will ask Peter to be the shepherd. And so it's, uh, it has this wider context of, of, yes, provision for the sheep, but it's always moving out into uh, how many others can we um, bring into this relationship? Not into this, and that's the that's kind of a mis misinterpretation. It's not into this fold that is then you know nobody else can get in and it's exclusive. Uh, but it's it's the the community. This fold is another uh, is a synonym for bringing one into relationship with Jesus. So it's this it's. Uh, it, it, to bring someone into the fold is not then uh, mean and, ex, and you know an exclusive place. It's bringing it's uh, it's bringing it one into this abiding intimate relationship with Jesus. And so it, it takes some nuance and a little bit of corrective when it comes to this passage because of some of the concerns that you've raised. Matt, Rolf. Yeah, I was I was going to pick up on that. Uh, it, that is, t it's it's an image of welcome that the open door, you know, um, as commentary on the man born blind, it's, it, it's welcome into community also, which I think is really important. So he's been put out, um, first of all, by his disability at first, unable to, you know, um, really be part of the community uh, in part because of stigmas, uh, um, irrationally attached to disability but also then, um, you know, this, that he's welcomed into a relationship with Christ, but also then the, the community. And so to me, that's the hopeful image of that uh, Jesus is the door. Um, so I really, I think that um, maybe especially in this time of being hunkered down uh, like Behind a lot of us doors, are yeah well you know yeah, yeah i mean yeah. um mm -hmm. that it's um you know i'm glad i have doors on my house mm -hmm. you know and uh but it's uh the purpose of a door is to welcome people into the you know mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. that community community and i think I, I i'm glad you brought that up rolf with regard to uh the status of the man born blind prior to this, you know, this encounter with Jesus uh, is that we, if you go back, I think it would be really, and, and remember that this uh, chapter nine, of course, was Lent four, uh, March, uh, March 22nd. And so as a preacher to go back and really read nine one through 1021 as a unit and just kind of see what kinds of connections you're making. Uh, because the the reality is for this man, uh, in terms of being put out, he was put out of his community. Uh, you get these imperfect verbs at the beginning of the passage of having to, con having constantly to beg uh, for his next <laughs> his his next meal, uh, and and so this that really then expands this image of pasture. It's that now that he's now he's provided for, and then he was, you know, as you said, thrown out again, and Jesus finds him. And I think another uh, another kind of correction on this as well, when you look at nine one through ten twenty one, sometimes we focus all on the scene, uh, but uh, the other real uh, critical sensorial experience here is hearing uh, that the man born blind first hears Jesus. Uh, and 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 then that's the connection that's made so significantly in the first part of the discourse is that 
uh, that the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They don't know the voice of a stranger. And so the sheep hear his voice. And so that hearing then brings life. And you could connect, I know my sheep by name, so you can make the connection to Lazarus and then Mary Magdalene, which we just heard. So this is not just, you know, oh, he's healed, uh, you know, he can see again, but he really has a kind of um, new life, uh, not kind of like a resurrected life. He's reborn. Um, when you start making all the connections throughout the gospel. And I, I know we could go on and on and on, but there are other passages like Acts, right? And I'm, well, I'm trying to figure out whether or not I want it to lean into Acts on that or to lean into Psalms on that, uh, because in both of those, uh, there, uh, uh, Ralph, you said a moment ago that doors are also for welcoming folks in. And um, one of the things that... Uh, um, for me as a single person who lives alone, when I welcome folks in, it's generally so that they can come and eat with me. And that's what the fellowship opportunity is. And um, this idea in Psalms of Jesus, uh, of God preparing uh, a table for us and the idea in Acts of them fellowshipping and gathering together all lean into this abundant life that is promised in John. And for me, these all of these texts just roll together. Uh, and, and there's a way, I think, to kind of echo all of them as we're preparing a sermon this coming week. Yeah, I, I think uh, Carolyn men mentioned that uh, John 9 was Lent 4. One of the curious things was uh, Lent 4 was also Psalm 23. So you get, uh, this is the year you get Psalm 23, Lent 4, and Easter 4. Um, you know, um, there are other psalms about sheep they could have used, actually. But it's, you know, it's always the psalm for uh, Easter 4. But I like the fact that you pick up, especially on the second half of the metaphor in Psalm 23, um, and uh, which is a psalm of trust, uh, and that great image of the, of, the, of the feast. And it's an image of honor and shame, you know, that is... Um, the presence of the enemies that um, the people who wish to see the psalm ashamed, there is God giving honor to, to that person. Um, and in, in our society that uh, obviously honor and shame are, are always factors. Shame is a lot, shame along with uh, resentment are you know, two of the biggest social emotions, uh, but we don't, but it's not, it's not as big of a social currency as, as it was then. So you can invite people to unpack that and, and help uh, give folks images for that. And um, really to understand the, the just enormous promise uh, uh, in that image. But let's move to Acts, um, uh, Matt. Yeah, there's no sheep in Acts 2. This is the, the one... One passage today, there's no reference to sheep. So if you're not a sheeple, you can, uh, you know, choose to preach on this text on, what is this, Good Shepherd Sunday, which I'd never heard of until we started this podcast, like 10 years ago or whatever it was. But I'm glad it exists. Acts 2. So this is, uh, it's still Pentecost, folks. It's the, uh, the, the miraculous beginnings of Pentecost are over. The sermon is over. The creation of the megachurch, as Joy called it last week, is over. And But this is still part of the Pentecost event, so to speak, is the creation of a community and a creation of a community that's full of generosity uh, and fellowship and mutuality and teaching and worship. It exists in homes. It exists in the temple. In some ways, it's different. I, I'm struck by the difference between the, the blind man, or the man born blind in uh, uh, the man born blind in John 9. And this, he went from a position of needing to beg and being very much an economic outcast and a social outcast to being brought into community. Here you've got a community of folks who are largely travelers, who are not from Jerusalem. The 120 who are still there after the crucifixion, we assume are mostly Galileans. They probably farm and fish for a living. There's nowhere to do that in Jerusalem. There's nowhere to stay in Jerusalem. So this community that's created on Pentecost is largely one that's gone from some place of security and sustenance to now being really very much at risk because of their witness to Christ. And the response to that is 
this radical uh, inwardly focused generosity, as well as an outwardly focused goodwill, which is interesting. They have goodwill among all the people. There's something about this group, which again, this is really dangerous for you know, hundreds, thousands of people now to start a movement that's meeting together in Jerusalem within two months of the crucifixion of a guy for being king of the Jews. I mean, there's just to help people get a sense for this not being a casual generosity, but a very risky one and a very difficult one uh, and hard to live out. And how that sounds at a time when, um, what is it, something like 30% of the workforce is unable to work at home and has lost access to regular means of employment, in, at least in the United States. I don't know what those numbers are like elsewhere. People are dying for any kind of generosity like this. So it calls for a creativity that was just as true then or just as difficult to come by then as it might seem now. I was, uh, we talked last week about the kind of uh, focus on spiritual practices uh, and, and being at home and what does that you know, what does that look like now that we have more time around the table and more time uh, together? And uh, I, I, I saw a sort of, uh, maybe not necessarily a pattern, but uh, some things that, that, that could mark, <laughs> mark this time that we see in this, you know, like you said, this early, this early community, Matt, that, you know, holding fast to the teaching, <laughs> Right, holding fast to uh, the teaching of the apostles, uh, togetherness, fellowship, sharing, uh, breaking bread together, and then prayer and praise. And so it's one of those things that I, I think like, oh, you could put it on a little post-it note and, uh, <laughs> you know, and have it, have, it, you know, have it where you gather and say, okay, uh, here's another day where we're, where we're you know, holding fast to the teachings that we know. Uh, we are, we're coming together, we're, we're sharing, we're in fellowship, we're breaking bread together, and we're praying and uh, praying and, and praising God. And that, you know, there's not a whole lot else we can do right now, but we can do that. And so here we have a model of, of you know, these first communities of believers who, uh, who did model a kind of way of, of being that I think we could actually do right now, um, particularly when all of, uh, so many of our other usual Christian practices or practices of faith are limited. Yeah, I appreciate the focus on practices. Uh, Jerusha Neal has written four great commentaries on Acts in a row. And one of the things she says about practices this week on the website is that these practices aren't meant to create an unchanging, unchanging kind of way of being Christian that we can always hold on to. It's to prepare us for change. It's to prepare us to be um, flexible to new challenges that come along. Right, Joy, were you gonna say something, Joy? I didn't feel like I cut you off. That, that's wonderful. I, I wanted to, to reference the, her commentary, but also um, uh, in, in, in the circles that I'm a part of, there have been folks that have um, um, come down with the virus and we've been praying for them. And in that, we've begun again for those folks who have come through it to be able to say, thanks be to God. And uh, we don't do that a lot. Uh, you know, it's, it's real easy sometimes for us to ask why God, why me, why us, why now, why this? Um, but it's also important that if we're going to call on God, that um, when someone comes through, that we are able to say that this is a wonder and we are grateful to God, and that that is why we praise. And so to be able to announce that is also a, a practice of uh, invitation to others to be able to say God is present, and God is still with us in the midst of all of this. We should talk briefly about First Peter. Next week, we're going to go backwards in First Peter. We'll go to the beginning of chapter 2. Everybody know why that is? Why do they go out of sequence in 1 Peter? Because there's a reference to sheep in verse 25. Uh, of course. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? Somewhere sure. Rolf is hurting Just inside, I can tell. Great. Anyway, 1 Peter. Some... I think we need to talk about suffering a little bit because... First Peter does, and I would just say this to anybody who's going to tackle this text this week is, 
if you endure pain while suffering unjustly, right, it's a credit to you. Christ suffered for you. We have to ask what kind of suffering. You have to say, what exactly is the author talking about? What kind of hardship are we talking about? This is not suffering for suffering's sake. This is this can't be taken as a way of saying suffering is redemptive, no matter what kind of suffering it is or in any kind of form or situation. So the kind of suffering that appears to be going on in the community that was first reading First Peter appears to be some kind of intense ostracism uh, on, as a result of their faith, as a result of their witness. That's a very different kind of suffering than what people are going through today, whether it's economic, uh, biological, social, uh, relational, uh, other ways in which we encounter violence. And so uh, it's just always worth saying, right? Whenever you encounter a kind of what appears to be a blanket reference to suffering in scripture, you have to ask what exactly, what are the, what are the, what are the, what are the contours of that suffering and why, and why would an author be somehow commending it in some way, shape or form? And the response to it is also a mindset um, that um, we don't take pride in our suffering. Um, we don't uh, make uh, suffering the opportunity for us to accuse our enemies, but that it, it becomes a place where we recognize that um, if we do the right thing, that we are going to suffer, that suffering is going to be a reality and that you don't take, um, you don't have recourse, you don't take vengeance uh, against those, that this isn't a place where you stand up and say, I'm better than you because I'm suffering. Um, it's not a place where you say you're bad because you're causing my suffering. It's a way where you are living um, uh, you're living in a way that causes folks to recognize you're different and that difference um, draws attention to yourself. So it's a mindset that makes me think, and, and I'll say this when, when uh, uh, I think it's next week when we go to the, the next reading in Peter, where um, it, is, it, it makes me think of the nonviolent response. Uh, through the civil rights movement, is that it was a particular mindset that was the mindset of Jesus on the cross, is that, that it, he was able to not uh, attack those who attacked him. And uh, I, I, I think if we're going to recognize that, that, as you're saying, Matt, why are we suffering? What kind of suffering is this? That we also don't take pride in it. Um, but that we have a mindset that says that um, we're recognizing something else is going on here. I'm not articulating that real well, but it, um, I really wanted to, to, to say that this is, uh, that we have to shift our perspective when we talk about suffering. And I think that's what you were saying, Matt. Uh, I was, and I think you articulated it just great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>